All right. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on when and where you are watching this. Um, welcome to this webinar. We will be talking about the Community Food Advocates Program that we have been running and a lot of the research that has been going into that this past year. Um, my name is David Hutabarat. I am the project coordinator here at Livewell, Colorado. And I am just introducing and just talking over a few housekeeping items to start off with. So just to begin, um, this webinar will be recorded. So we will email the link once it is edited and we have the link for it and we'll send that out to everybody who signed up for this. And then one other thing is if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom. Um, so go ahead and type in your questions, any comments that you might have um, during any time of the presentation. And at the end, we're gonna have time for question and answers and I'll be moderating that so that we can uh, answer some of those questions. So let's go ahead and get started. Let me pull up the presentation right now and we will be starting with Wendy. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Great, um, good morning. And as David said, good afternoon. Um, this is Wendy peters Muschetti, and I am the Food Systems Director here at Live Well Colorado. Next slide, please. Um, and as David said, we just wanted to welcome you to this webinar um, on the learnings that we are in the middle of hearing about from our first season of the Community Food Advocate Program to support our Double Up Food Bucks Colorado program. There were over 60 people registered for this webinar. So thank you and welcome to all of you from wherever you're calling in from, people from all over the state of Colorado and from other states in the nation as well. Um, so thank you for joining us. I will also give one caveat to the webinar as, as webinars will do in Zoom sessions, um, there often are technical difficulties. Um, and we have people calling in from across the state and rural parts of the state. So do bear with us if there's ever a glitch or a lapse. So. But welcome, thank you for being here. Next slide, please. So very quickly, since there are some new folks on the line with us here today who may not be familiar with LiveWell, we are the statewide organization that manages both a Double Up Food Box and Community Food Advocate Program across Colorado. We have a mission to increase access to healthy eating and active living by removing barriers that inequitably and disproportionately affect low-income communities and people of color across the state. To help us achieve that mission, we have a specific food systems goal to build a sustainable, equitable, and health-promoting food environment. And to help us advance that goal is sort of what brought us to being involved with Double Up Food Bucks Colorado um, in the first place. So next slide, please. Great, so then a little bit about what you're gonna hear today. You already met David Kudabarit, and I am Wendy. And just to let you know a little bit about um, who else you will be hearing from today as well, we have a series of speakers lined up for you. For you. So Eva Corangrato is on the line. She is a part of our Double Up Food Bucks evaluation team. She's an undergraduate here at the University of Colorado Boulder um, Environmental Studies, where she focuses on issues of food systems and sustainable urban development and environmental ethics. And she is working on this evaluation as part of her honors thesis here at CU. You will be hearing primarily from Eva today about her process and her findings of doing a series of in-depth interviews with the community food advocates um, from, that worked with us in 2017. After Eva, we will be joined by a few community food advocates. So part of one of the um, glitches I may have, have mentioned to you and warned you about, and possibly a technical glitch, we have lined up uh, three community food advocates to hear from. Um, only one is on the line right now, so and that is Tashara. So hopefully, um, by the time Eva is done, we will be joined by Midge Kirk, who's a community, who was a community food advocate in the southwest part of the state supporting the Cortez area in 2017, and from Wendelin Omanya, who was a community food advocate supporting the Durango region in southwest Colorado in 2017. And then finally, from Tashara Loiselle, who is currently a community food advocate in Garfield County supporting the rifle area. And again, apologies if we are not joined by Midge and Wendelin today, but we will get a lot of information from Eva and Tashara. Next slide, please. So before I pass the buck or pass the mic over to um, Eva, 
I just wanted to do a little bit of a background on the Double Up Food Bucks program, um, as that is the program that's really the center of all this and what community food advocates are working around. Um, so Double Up Food Bucks Colorado, assuming a lot of you are familiar with the Double Up Food Bucks program, uh, really coined and launched out of Fair Food Network in Michigan. And we came in under the banner of Fair Food Network's Double Up Food Bucks model in 2016 when we at Livol received a three-year grant from the USDA called the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Grant to fund this, what's called a SNAP incentive program, SNAP being Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly called Food Stamps. So the way Double Up Food Bucks works in Colorado is akin to um, the other Double Up Food Bucks model, where for every dollar spent in SNAP benefits at one of our partner sites, you get a dollar match, up to $20 per visit. But that extra dollar, the incentive, can only be spent on fresh Colorado-grown fruits and vegetables. We grew a lot from 2016 to 2017. Um, last season, we operated about 100 different locations in 28 counties across the state, including an increasingly high number of winter and year-round markets. Next slide, please. So this is just to, to, to demonstrate as well, as we sort of grown in sites, we've also been diversifying the types of sites where Double Up Food Bucks is offered um, and the types of sites where community food advocates will be supporting participation. Um, so this slide just shows that still about half of our sites really are farmers markets, but increasingly diversified into like a farm stand model, a small corner store model, and now actually four large grocery retailers around Metro Denver. Next slide, please. So leads us to community food advocates and its role in the Double Up Food Bucks. And it, it really is a support project to support Double Up Food Bucks. There are two high level goals. Um, we think many other benefits, but two high-level goals to Community Food Advocate Program. To increase participation in the Double Up Food Bucks Program, and also to increase skills and capacity for the advocates themselves, so professional development skills. Advocates are primarily Double Up participants, SNAP recipients themselves, and all of them are very trusted community members and leaders locally. Advocates lead local face-to-face -face outreach to other SNAP recipients, and key community partners in order to increase participation in Double Up Food Bucks. Advocates are reimbursed, they're paid a monthly stipend and, and reimbursed for all of their mileage done for the job. Um, and then we work together, live well staff and advocates on a variety of trainings and opportunities and professional development opportunities. Next slide, please. So the Community Food Advocate Program, um, we piloted it last summer, really, um, in just two areas in Denver and the southwest corner of the state. And then this past fall, we received the USDA Community Food Project grant um, to, to expand it, to grow it across the state, and also to sustain it for two more years. So the program currently um, is operating in Denver, the southwest part of the state, Boulder County, Garfield County, Montrose County, and the San Luis Valley. Hopefully those mean things to people who are calling in from Colorado. Um, our role here at LiveWell is we, we, cre we created sort of, we're like logistically holding the reins here on this program. You know, we, we, we created the recruitment materials and sort of led recruitment, the descriptions, the scopes of work, the invoicing and paperwork and all that really fun stuff. Um, we built a training manual for advocates and sort of organized sort of all the onboarding for advocates. Um, I should say as well, um, I'm not spending a whole lot of time talking about how we built this program, but if anyone anywhere is interested in seeing any of these materials, um, please let me know. Our email, we'll show our emails at the end of the, the talk here. I am happy to share the grant rewrote, training manual rewrote, recruitment materials, anything that might be of interest to anyone else considering an advocate type program. Advocates um, are supported by a regional partner. So when we reached out to certain regions, um, which we did very strategically and thoughtfully about where we really wanted to support Double Up Food Bucks, we also reached out to a local partner, a local nonprofit, or in some instances, county public health, someone that we had been working with for a while around Double Up Food Bucks, and they're there locally when we cannot be to be a strategy partner, brainstorming partner, um, just a support for those advocates working locally. Statewide advocates and Live Well staff, and regional partners we gather once a month for a monthly call to really just share and strategize and update each other 
about what everyone has been up to. And then advocates submit monthly invoices along with monthly activity logs to us at LiveWell detailing sort of where they were and how many people they reached and was it effective and things like that. So next slide, please. So just one last note before I pass it over to Eva um, is, although we have two different grants, this is really, so we see the Community Food Advocate program as part of the Double Up program. So we're really trying to integrate the way we do evaluation of the Advocate program with our evaluation of Double Up Food Bucks Colorado. So in our original Double Up evaluation framework, we had a couple of questions um, that I'm showing here about what environmental, social, and institutional features best support redemption of Double Up. And then what are factors and conditions that can affect the implementation of a highly effective healthy food incentive program? And we feel like the use of community food advocates and what we're learning from them can help us answer these questions about what are these other conditions and activities that really can support a highly effective incentive program. So that's where the community food advocate evaluation piece falls in. And what Eva is going to share with you is one specific tool we've used, although there have been many other inputs, is this sort of what we call sort of exit interviews, so these in-depth phone interviews that Eva conducted with all of the 2017 advocates um, is, you know, what, what we heard from those interviews and now her, you know, Eva's chance to really summarize those and share all of the learnings on the process and feedback even for us as we manage these programs, but also, you know, what we've learned about what is really sort of a high effect, highly effective for advocates to be doing to support the program. So with that, I will pass it over to Eva to dive right in. Thank you, Eva. Thanks, Wendy. Hi, everyone. As Wendy mentioned, my name is Eva Corangrado, and I'm an undergraduate student in the Environmental Studies Department at the University of Colorado Boulder. And today I'm going to share some of the findings from the evaluation of the Community Food Advocate Program for the 2017 pilot season. Before we begin, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Jill Litt at the University of Colorado for her guidance through this process and the rest of the evaluation team uh, for their contributions and support. Next slide, please. Uh, so just an overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, first, I'll explain the goals of the evaluation and the data collection methods that were used. And then I'm, I will be sharing the findings from the interviews with the advocates. And finally, I'll just discuss some of the implications of those findings and some overall recommendations based on the findings and the implications. Next slide, please. Uh, so before setting off with the evaluation, we outlined goals for the evaluation and some aspects of the Community Food Advocate Program that we wanted to understand. First, we sought to understand the outreach strategies used by advocates to reach potential participants in Double Up. Second, we wanted to understand how advocates were communicating with each other and whether they desired more or less collaboration in their outreach efforts. We also wanted to identify any barriers to participation in Double Up as perceived by the advocates. So these would be barriers that advocates observe, not barriers that participants experience, since we were just speaking with advocates in these interviews. And finally, through the evaluation process, we wanted to be able to provide some recommendations to live well and potentially to others for how to improve this advocate program or similar advocate programs in the next market season. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to begin this process, we identified several questions to use as a guide for the evaluation, all revolving around the, one of the central short-term goals of the advocate program, which is to increase participation in Double Up Food Bucks. We first wanted to understand what role advocates play in increasing participation in Double Up, along with how they are increasing participation, both what has been effective and what they have found to maybe be less effective. And in addition, we wanted to identify any ways that the advocate program could be more effective in increasing participation. Next slide, please. And the evaluation was conducted through qualitative interviews with all of the advocates. So this included six community food advocates and two regional coordinators. Um, half of the advocates and one coordinator conducted their outreach efforts in the Denver metro area and the other half of 
advocates and the other regional coordinator did outreach in southwestern Colorado, as Wendy was mentioning earlier, which uh, for those of you who are outside of the state, the southwest of Colorado is a bit more of a rural region, and that's going to play into some of the findings that we have. Um, these interviews were conducted in December 7, 2017 and January 2018 at the conclusion of the 2017 market season. And before we move on, I would like to acknowledge that while we did interview all of the advocates in uh, the entire advocate population, that population is quite small. There were, are only eight advocates. So the power of these findings are somewhat limited beyond the scope of LiveWell's specific advocate program. And so to emphasize this in the results, I've included the number of advocates who mentioned things just to um, kind of remind us all that we are working with a very small sample size and data set here. But I still think that these findings are hopefully valuable. Uh, next slide, please. So the first set of findings I'm going to discuss are findings on uh, program implementation, which was mostly revolving around the outreach strategies that advocates were using um, to increase participation in Double Up Food Bucks. These included partnering with other institutions and community organizations, attending farmers markets and other locations where Double Up is accepted, as well as attending um, out, uh, conducting outreach at supermarkets. And another common, um, common strategy was posting flyers in around the community where, where they might be seen by community members. And some of the main takeaways from the discussion of these strategies was the importance of face-to-face -face and personalized interaction with per potential participants. Advocate mentions that this builds a rapport with potential Double Up Food Bucks members and allows advocates to dispel myths about farmers markets, address any concerns people might have uh, with using the program or understanding how the program works, and allows them to highlight the benefits of Double Up. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so six advocates specifically mentioned working with other institutions to promote Double Up Food Bucks. All six reported having positive interactions with these other institutions, while one of the six had kind of a mixed experience where some institutions were responsive and one institution in that region um, was kind of unresponsive and just had a little bit too much going on to incorporate Double Up into, into their practices. I provided a list of all of the organizations and institutions that, out, that advocates reached out to, and all the ones listed here aided in promoting Double Up Food Bucks and were eager and positively engaged with at least one advocate. So there are many partners here, and um, uh, to highlight some that, were, uh, that came up a lot were um, WIC and Cooking Matters were commonly partnered with with our advocates. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the advocates also identified certain challenges in implementing Double Up Food Bucks. These included difficulties to explain what some advocates called a complex program in a way that was understandable to potential participants. In addition, some advocates faced challenges engaging with different communities and how to communicate with these communities. And finally, one advocate described low-income communities as being somewhat of a moving target, as financially insecure um, individuals and families are often vulnerable to displacement. And consequently, this advocate lo saw lots of change in the population of Double Up Food Bucks, Bucks eligible people throughout the season, making it more difficult to do outreach and form relationships in the community. Uh, next slide, please. In addition, three advocates made comments that map onto the concept of essentially the level of receptivity of the community to a new input, such as a new program like Double Up. And this kind of mapped onto three areas of the community readiness, the knowledge of the efforts, which would be the knowledge of food, double food bucks in the community, the resources and leadership available in the community, and the community climate. The community's readiness was somewhat low in that most potential double up participants were not aware of the program when advocates conducted outreach. 
However, this just points to the need for more messaging and more advocacy in the community. The readiness was higher in terms of resources and leadership in that most institutions and community organizations were excited about the program and were eager to promote it. And finally, community readiness was somewhat low in that many advocates revealed that some potential double up participants viewed farmers markets as unwelcoming, expensive, and elitist. And this offered an opportunity with these kind of personalized and face-to-face -face interactions that advocates were having to dispel some of these myths and answer questions people might have, particularly for those who had never attended a farmer's market. Altogether, these findings suggest that there is moderate readiness for Double Up Food Bucks and that increased outreach through advocate programs could raise the level of readiness in the community. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, five advocates mentioned specific barriers that they felt prevented or hindered people from participating in Double Up Food Bucks. These included language barriers, inexperienced cooking their own food, which was a concern for buying fresh food at the farmer's markets, and uh, some intimidation of navigating a new shopping experience for the first time. In particular, several advocates emphasized that the timing of markets may be inconvenient, particularly for low-income individuals. They noted that markets held on Saturday mornings, as many are, is not an ideal time for those who work long hours or multiple jobs during the week, as this timing intersects with um, time they might be spending resting or spending time with family. Um, the location of the farmer's markets uh, may be an additional barrier, particularly for those in the Southwest. This came up with uh, many of the uh, advocates in the Southwest. As people, uh, as that community is more rural, people then have to drive into town on, on Saturday morning to do their grocery shopping, as opposed to having the convenience of shopping at a farmer's market, or excuse me, at a supermarket or um, some other location after work when they may already be in town. Um, in addition, advocates noted that there are um, cultural differences in food preferences and shopping norms and traditional cultural foods may not be available or may not be available as consistently at farmers markets. And this kind of uncertainty in the availability of food and the kinds of foods that are available can discourage some individuals from shopping at these markets. And finally, two advocates mentioned that particularly among Hispanic communities, there is considerable distrust in federal programs and programs related to government programs. Uh, in the current political climate. Advocates mentioned that some potential participants were hesitant to reveal that they are SNAP recipients as they are wary of identifying themselves in unnecessary ways and worry about sharing too much personal information. And with this respect to addressing these barriers, outreach strategies like personalized and one-on-one -on -one communication can help in, break down, in breaking down these barriers and the advocates inter interfacing with communities in this way allows them to address these, uh, these barriers and come up with strategies to help participants feel more comfortable or have more access to double up as a program. Next slide, please. Five advocates uh, mentioned uh, strategies that they used to communicate amongst themselves, which included mostly phone calls, emails, and texts. Uh, many advocates enjoyed sharing success stories and ideas with fellow, fellow advocates. Um, these, advo these advocates who spoke about communication amongst themselves mentioned the importance of keeping track of contacts made in the community and communications with other organizations and institutions, both so that they can know which organizations or which areas of the community need to be reached out to and haven't been, um, haven't been addressed and also so that they can ensure that they don't contact the same organization twice. Um, furthermore, it was useful to have a plan for meetings and call-ins as the advocates really valued uh, this efficient use of their time. Some advocates also identified challenges communicating with other advocates, which included slow response times and irregular communication throughout the season. 
Um, and to remedy these challenges, a communication plan or expectations surrounding the frequency of communication could address these challenges. Uh, next slide, please. Five advocates mentioned specific successes or reflected positively on their experience as an advocate. Some of these successes included increasing participation um, generally, recruiting from social media, breaking down barriers to participation as discussed in uh, the barriers um, section, and receiving positive feedback from Double Up Food Bucks participants that they enjoyed the program, that they were sharing it with um, a friends that they have and that they really valued the benefit and that they felt that it was impacting their families positively. In addition, nearly all advocates, seven of the eight, showed perceived success or meaning making when reflecting on their experience as an advocate. Meaning making refers to an effect where individuals make sense of their experience. In this context, advocate experiences integrated into their life stories their passions and contributed purpose to their lives. This effect, I think, is exemplified by a quote from one of the advocates below, saying, this is really my passion. This is my heart. It builds me as a community member. And this was kind of the sentiment I received from a lot of these advocates, that they really felt engaged and purposeful in their work as advocates. And this effect and this experience of meaning making is important in that advocates who feel purposeful in their work will be more likely to be successful and fulfilled through it. Slide, please. And finally, for the findings that I'll be discussing today, um, I have a list of recommendations and feedback for Live Well. And these recommendations and feedback are, are coming directly from advocates. Um, some of the recommendations include more opportunities for advocates to meet face-to-face -face and to collaborate on outreach strategies. Um, some advocates mentioned the importance of establishing institutional relationships early in the season, so generally before markets begin, if it's a less kind of summer seasonal market, um, as this allows this connection to be built before um, before the market is going and possibly when the, the, these institutions have less on their plate. In addition, it was recommended by some advocates to map the areas where outreach is being conducted to have a geographic understanding of the extent and distribution of outreach efforts and to identify areas that may be missed and maybe more opportunities to reach um, eligible double up participants. In terms of feedback for LiveWell, some advocates mentioned that the time they spent building relationships in the community should be valued, and that they felt that these, these efforts were not captured by the forms that they were filling out to record their outreach efforts and their time, um, as, they are, as these forms were geared towards more formal types of advocacy and outreach work. In addition, um, some advocates requested the opportunity to give live well feedback, um, other than in the form of their, their comments that they made to me during these interviews to maybe have a more, um, a more formal or more regular opportunity to give feedback. Um, as well, some advocates commented that live well staff felt distant at times and that they would enjoy regular individual check-ins in the future, both for troubleshooting an organization and to be able to ask questions and get prompt responses. Um, and finally, some advocates felt the extent of work that they conducted and the expectations of a, the program did not align with the amount of compensation they received. Um, and that was not all advocates who felt these ways, but um, these, um, these items were mentioned several times. Uh, next slide, please. Now I'll move into discussion of these findings. We saw earlier that a common implementation strategy was to involve other organizations and institutions. And I think this is an important point to focus on. This is important for outreach as well as building community readiness. But perhaps the most uh, valuable effect 
of these institutional partners and strengthening bonds and capacity between institutions is that institutions can serve as nodes in social networks. As individuals, advocates, like all of the rest of us, are immersed in our own social network web. As, the, as illustrated by these colors in the graphics, um, most individuals in a network tend to know the same kinds of people or tend to, tend to associate with the same groups, which makes connecting with nodes very um, important as nodes offer um, the opportunity to bridge between these smaller communities and groups. So in engaging with institutions, um, and, uh, we can access these nodes and bridge the gap between, between communities. And in this way, institutions are really valuable in outreach efforts and can act as a multiplier in reaching potential participants. Next slide, please. And another implication I wanted to discuss is the efficacy of the Community Food Advocate Program to encourage behavior change. So throughout this ana the analysis of these interviews, one component that really stuck out to me was the need to integrate the model of the Community Food Advocate Program with models of behavior change. Looking at the image on the left with the concentric circles, um, Double Up Food Bucks um, acts at the organizational level as a, as a, uh, excuse me, um, organizational level. So it's affecting the environment and gives, gives individuals the opportunity and resources to change their health behaviors. However, there's still a behavior here that needs to be changed even when the environment is conducive to the behavior change. So sometimes providing opportunity or incentive like double up is not always enough, especially in this case when we are asking participants to change their shopping habits, which for some may be a significant behavior change. Um, and this is where the Community Food Advocate Program can effectively intervene on the interpersonal and community levels to encourage behavior change. Looking at the example of, um, be, of a behavior change model on the right, in the rightmost image, um, it seems that advocates can play a role in the preparation, action, and maintenance phases of behavior change. Thus, I think it's reasonable to consider the community food advocate model in this light. Say, for example, is one point of contact, such as discussing double up, with a SNAP recipient at a supermarket enough to encourage behavior change. For some people it may be, and simply having the information may prompt them to make behavior change, and for others they need, may need more encouragement. It may then be reasonable to explore how advocates can engage with potential participants several times and in different ways throughout these various stages of behavior change. I don't have a complete answer here, but I think it's worth considering the ways that advocates can engage in the action and maintenance stages of behavior change, which I think will be effective in encouraging and maintaining participation in Double Up. Next slide, please. And finally, I have some more general recommendations based on the findings of this evaluation. While it's challenging to generalize beyond the context of this program, particularly as I mentioned that these, um, these results and these findings are from interviews with only eight advocates, these would be my recommendations for others thinking of implementing similar programs. I would suggest focusing on outreach uh, on developing networks between institutions and establishing these relationships early in the process as suggested by advocates. Create systems for cataloging advocate activity and communication. Uh, consider how advocate activities can interact with behavior change models in developing the strategies and uh, outreach um, activities that advocates conduct. Um, develop paper and digital promotional materials that are specific to the community. This came out particularly in the, the contextual differences between the um, the Denver metro area and the Southwest, and maybe a need for different kinds of distributional materials based on the communities and the social networks that exist in those communities. And finally, leveraging institutional resources to plan events and outreach aimed at reducing barriers 
to participation. Uh, thank you for your attention today. This is all I have um, in terms of my formal presentation and I will be available for questions at the end if you have any. Um, but for now, I'll be turning the floor over to, oh yes, this is our contact information. Um, uh, Wendy is definitely the best person to go to for general double up food box questions. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about the evaluation. Um, and this is also, uh, as Wendy mentioned, I'm an undergraduate. This is my first time doing anything like this. And if uh, you are inclined to offer feedback on this presentation, that would be very welcome. Um, so thank you. And I'll turn this over to our advocates. Um, I don't know if we have Midge on the line or not, or maybe it's Tashara. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I think Tashara will be speaking next. Hi, this is Tashara Loisel. I'm located in Rifle, Colorado in Garfield County. Not a large town, but we are here. Um, I have a six year, almost a six year old child who is on the autism spectrum. And he is the reason that I believe in this program. Um, the healthier our children eat, no matter what their background is or what their needs are, the better for them. And something that we can just doesn't cut it when uh, your child has autism. So when I was given this opportunity through my certified diabetes education uh, specialist, because I'm a diabetic on an insulin pump, when she forwarded this to me, she was like, this sounds like it's up your alley, you know, look into this. I did. I contacted Wendy. And after qualifications or whatever, uh, Wendy, you know, sent me an email and said, yes, let's, you know, are, if you're still interested, let's do this. And I jumped on board. Uh, some positive things about this endeavor that I'm on with everyone is I get to put my story out there. And I'll tell you, it's hard. Um, not everyone wants to hear that your child is high-functioning autism or all of the other challenges that my son has, especially when you're in a small town that is very um, pro-self, is what I'll say. So being in things like having interviews on the phone, um, being in publications that are on the internet and things like that. Most people in this town, if I post it, they, they may or may not look at it and they may or may not respond. So I can't give feedback from any of those, honest, uh, to be honest with you. I have noticed that the phone, stop speaking to people on the phone, like the school board or the principal or uh, our local food banks, like Lift Up and Reach Out Colorado and the Adventist Church, places like that, that is the first way to start. And then you set up an appointment and you go in and you're honest and you say hello and you're friendly. And I'm from down south. I've only been in Colorado three years. So I do use the word y'all and I do use the word sweetie and dear. And some people like that and some people don't. But you have to know what people are going to like. And that is where the whole psychology part of this being a community food advocate is, especially when you're coming from a town like Tampa, Florida, and moving to a town like Rifle, Colorado. So know who your audience is and be able to put yourself out there. It's hard to be honest and give a little piece of yourself to everyone that you meet. But it makes it a personal experience, and that's what people want. There's not enough personal experiences these days. We all hide behind our mask. So that's one thing that community food advocates, I believe, need to do is to say, hey, this is my situation. This is what I'm doing. This is why I believe in this. Um, one of the cons that I have found in my little town is things like door hangers 
and flyers if they're unsolicited. Um, let's say that you put them on a car or something like that. 99% of the time are not going to be effective here because you don't know if they're going to blow off. People just kind of take them and toss them on the ground or whatever. So it's definitely speaking to businesses and to individuals and to recipients directly face-to-face -face and social media. Oh, my goodness. Social media is one of the biggest things that influences anything in the town that I live in and the little towns around it, too. I've learned that very, very well. The more positive you speak about something, the more people are going to jump on it. But if you speak negative, like they say, you tell say one bad thing, it's going to go to 10 people. One good thing, it's going to go to three. And that's the experience that I've had here. As far as the language barrier, that's definitely something that I am running into. I don't speak Spanish. I only speak English, even though I have a Cuban background. And that is a huge barrier. So I do rely on my friends who speak Spanish to help me out with the Spanish community. If we had something that would help with that, that would be great. Um, I'm looking into learning Spanish so I can communicate more freely in my community. And that's something that would be a suggestion. As far as communications with other community food advocates, that would be lovely. Um, I wouldn't mind if someone text message me or phone called me or um, anything like that to be able to bounce ideas off of each other. It's a more personal experience to meet in person, but that's not always doable. And I understand that. I hope that we become budget friendly and be able to meet more than, you know, once a year or something like that. And let me see. I think I've touched on everything, actually. Thank you so much, Tashara, for sharing your experience with the Community yeah. Food Advocates Program. No worries. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome to have you. Um, so if anybody has any questions right now, you can feel free to jump onto the chat box um, and, and we'll take some questions um, that we can go ahead and answer. Okay, so we have one question from the audience right now, and it is, what type of materials did organizations and partners say they needed most? And this is for anybody. Um, I can offer, uh, oh, mm -hmm. so shall I go ahead if you like. No, ma'am, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, this wasn't addressed uh, specifically in many of the, the advocate interviews from last season, other than they just wanted to know um, um, what, how the program worked um, and how to refer people. So kind of like an um, actionable way to uh, be involved in the program. I don't know much beyond that. Perhaps, um, perhaps uh, Tashara would, could, um, has insight from any anyone she's talked to. I don't know about that. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um. I actually um, have spoken to places like Lift Up and Reach Out Colorado who distribute, who distribute food bags and food out to the community. And um, The Rock is what we call it, uh, Reach Out Colorado, gives something to our schools uh, parents sign up for it. It's a really very basic, simple form. Your name, address, how many children you have. It's no really financial information. And we can't, and I say we because every Thursday I do this, we hand out bags of food to children in the school. They come down and it's called the garden club in our school, so it's not embarrassing uh, for the students. And we hand them a bag of food and I think that the opportunity to put flyers in those bags 
for my community is coming up. Um, it's a lot of volunteering on my end. Uh, if you want something done, you do it, especially if you want it done to your specifications. And there's a lot of need, but not volunteers. There's not a lot of people that are going out in the, in the, to the community and giving as they receive. So what I've been speaking to them about is the double-sided, that we literally just got them, um, double-sided paper that has in English and Spanish what the Double Up Food Bucks program is and what it does. And basically the phone number in, to find a participating venue in your area. That's been a really big thing that people have been like, oh, that's nice. You know, I can take that and I can put it up. I can put it on my on my wall because a lot of people, organizations here, Mind Springs, things like that, has places where you can put stuff up. But it has to be in English and Spanish because they cater to both. And things like the big posters that we just received that are only in English, or that I saw I received at the beginning, that are only in English, they're, and I hate to use this term, wishy-washy, because they do want the Spanish also. Because even though some of our participants do know English, they may not speak English in front of other people because of stereotypes and things like that. Some of them do not speak at all, so you don't know what language they speak. And I've run into that multiple times where I live. And this is Wendy. If you're, um, thank you, Tashara. I just wanted to add in a few other things that maybe we have heard um, as requested from advocates around the state as well. Um, swag is definitely a big one just having things to constantly give 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 and so um, it's not something we did a good job budgeting for very early on but we have double up food bucks um, bags we, you know we have grocery bags the double up food bucks logo and just even having something like that that people can simply hand out has been helpful having like t-shirts and pins double up food bucks t-shirts that advocates can wear we actually ran out of t-shirts we're going to try to order some more has been helpful we also have received many requests and have been slowly but fulfilling them to have very regionalized flyers. And like, and to Tashara's point that the flyers and door hangers and things like that um, are somewhat limited um, in how you use them, but having something that's really clear, really simple steps and very regionalized in nature about where to go for more information has been very helpful. So we actually have completely redesigned um, all of our outreach materials this year from 2017, we made them much simpler. Um, as always, all of our materials, our website, every flyer, every door hanger, every poster, everything is always available in English and Spanish um, and additional languages upon request. Um, this year, they're just simpler and then we're customizing some regional flyers for some partners, which will help some of these issues. And then David, I don't know, back to you to see if there are other questions we can address yes. and if Mitch um, has been able to join. Yes, um, so next question. Uh, what was the work time expectation for the advocates? Time per week and overall hours for the season? Sure, I can answer that question. This is Wendy. Um, so we have been probably pretty loosey-goosey about this. We, we wanted to avoid very formalized set hour requirements. So the way we set it is, um, the advocate, the monthly stipend was th is three hundred dollars a month plus mileage, with the expectation that that equates to about maybe fifteen hours or so of Double Up Foods Bucks focus work a month. However, we don't require actual hour documentation on the invoice. When they submit the invoices and the activity logs, there is a place we ask, you know, for how many hours you spent doing each activity but we are not tracking that. We do not, we do not base the stipend on that. We also realized that things have been slow month to month. So we had an advocate had a very, very slow January, but then had a very, very busy February. And she still just received a flat $300 a month um, because that worked for her. 
We also have said that, you know, we ask for about a six month commitment, knowing that things happen and life changes. Um, but we have a very simple scope of work that we assign with each other to get us, you know, into six month blocks, which really gives us time to build relationships. Some advocates obviously have and will stay with us longer than that even. Um, we also have tried to be flexible with that stipend in that if it works better for someone to do like two really, really busy months, maybe it's, you know, $600 a month for two months um, instead of spread out over a longer period of time. Um, so we do, we have never run into this yet. If we were to, to see, you know, activity log come back with like a couple hours a month, a couple months in a row, we would have a conversation about that, but that of course has not happened. Um, the note I'll say about the stipend as well, we are um, constantly trying to do one-on-one -on -one work. Most of the advocates we work with now, I think all but two are SNAP recipients. Um, and just being really careful about how that affects sort of their monthly, sort of the gross revenue and how, um, you know, at some point to any dollars may make people ineligible and sort of that balance of, we want to be, fair, of course, and we want to pay everyone a lot more than we do right now, um, but also working with individuals about what's going to work with their budget. Thanks, David. Um, so I, we got a couple questions talking about the farmer markets themselves. Um, so I'm going to try and summarize uh, these questions. Um, so based off of the community food advocates experience um, and what they were hearing from SNAP recipients, could you talk a little bit about, about what makes a welcoming or an exceptional double up location or a farmer's market? Um, and what are some of your recommendations or suggestions based on these findings to, um, to, uh, for, for uh, locations to be more welcoming and exceptional uh, double up locations? Tashara, maybe you can take that one first. I, uh, our farmer's market recently, li literally this past year, relocated from one place to another. Um, the first time that I went to the farmer's market here in Rifle, it was on a, 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 a grab, like an asphalt gravel ground. Um, when the sun hit, when the sun hit, you know, it gets pretty hot in Colorado. Um, it was just like beaming with heat and, and it was hard to go. You practically waited till it was, you know, dark to go. I mean, it was, it was awful. So they relocated it to <clears throat> a small park that we have on our main, one of our main roads, which is called Railroad. It literally goes through the town um, all the way. So that was so much better. And although it's, it's, the parking's a little bit more complicated, we do have the middle school and high school across the street. So we can park there and walk across the street. The police force has come out and, you know, they're helping us go across the street and things like that. So that's very helpful. There's a crosswalk. It's about accessibility. Um, you necessarily have to park right there, you know, in front of one of the stands, but being able or to get to the farmer's market instead of having to walk a very long distance or to go over the street. I mean, we have a one lane each. So something that's accessible is a good idea. And something that's comfortable, that's not hot, that the Farmers that the participants in farmers market, the vendors can set up easily and be able to section your farmers market off to where they're not piled on top of each other, um, where you can move easily between each and every vendor because although it's not only farmers there, there's other vendors there too that make up. I don't know about any other farmers markets, but our farmers market has. LaRue or the, the, the tights or uh, hydroponics and all of these other things. So a variant at a farmer's market is really good. We don't have that down south. We have farmer's markets, period. There's, there's vegetables, there's all of that kind of thing. So we don't have <laughs> other business at our farmer's market. So it's a very nice, it's a very nice and neat model here where you have other 
things like Mary Kay or something in a farmer's market in our town. Awesome. Um, so let me finish this up with one more question. Um, how do you think farmer market managers can use these findings from the community food advocates to better use, promote, operate, double up at their locations? Um, I can offer, this is Eva, I can offer possibly some, some answers here um, or suggestions. Um, we got some information from advocates, both in terms of um, feedback from participants that they you know, want the process to be streamlined. They want to understand how to, uh, how to navigate the farmer's market, but um, also doing that in a way that doesn't draw so much attention to their using the program. I think sometimes there's a little bit of self-consciousness around um, you know, identifying yourself as a, as a SNAP recipient or a Double Up Food Bucks user, even if they're enthusiastic about the program. Um, so I think having uh, market managers as well as vendors who are who are welcoming and who understand the process is really helpful in making new um, new farmers market goers, new Double Up Food Bucks users comfortable in the markets. As well as um, sometimes there's some there was a suggestion of having some graphics in the markets. Um, you know what kind of things you can buy with Double Up. What's seasonal. Um, and when, just so that that's more easily understandable, um, and uh, kind of facilitating uh, the use of the market without m maybe necessarily having this huge, bright <laughs> double up food bucks uh, uh, kiosk that everyone's meant to go to. Go to. So it's, uh, I guess, kind of a, a balance there is, I guess, what I heard most. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Tashara. Thank you, David. This is Wendy again. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Midge, wherever you are, for trying to join from Cortez, Colorado. Um, and to all of you who called in today and those of you that didn't, you will all be hearing from us if you registered for this webinar. We will send out uh, the recording link to this webinar. Um, share it far and wide if you want to. We will also attach the PowerPoint. Uh, that, that Eva developed. Um, please share that as well. As you know, as Eva and I, Eva and I shared our email addresses, they're also in the PowerPoint. Please feel free to follow up with either one of us with questions, and we're happy to connect you um, to others, um, to other community food advocates as well, um, if you have questions for advocates themselves. So thank you all for your time, and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.